Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in today. On behalf of the University of California San Francisco Alumni Association, the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, welcome to the second webinar of our series titled Emotional Well-Being in 2021. This week's topic is pandemic transitions from collective grief to joy. We invite you to submit questions by using the Q&A function at the bottom of, of your Zoom screen. We'll save time towards the end of the program to answer as many questions as time allows. I will now turn it over to our host, Dr. Alyssa Eppel. Thank you, John. Welcome everyone. Welcome back to our second series of Emotional Wellbeing. I am just so delighted to be here with you and with these very special guests. Today, we're talking about pandemic transitions from collective grief to joy. This whole webinar series is about transitions to the new world. The pandemic was just one, it was like a trigger that opened our eyes to the collective state of our being and our relationships to each other and to the earth. And at this moment, at this transitional state, Really, the transition is that our awareness is really quite elevated about what we, what we need to do um, for, the, for well-being, personal and collective. The, uh, this, I thought we were gonna be talking about exiting the pandemic. And I think when we made up the title, transitions was a, a better description than recovery because we're just on a bridge. We're not here, we're not there. We're collectively still in the thick of the pandemic, watching our brothers, sisters, family across the world, India, Brazil, other places in the US that are still in the thick of it. Yet many of us are re-entering society in a way embodied in person. And with this question of what are we returning to? It won't feel like business as usual, things feel different, but it's hard to move forward without some looking at and acknowledging the personal losses, the grief, as well as the state of the world. So today we're gonna to talk about grief and joy. Grief is a process. How can we identify grief, be with it, and at the same time experience the joy in life in a fuller way, maybe in a fuller way than we have this past year? Part of that answer is in the collective experience we are all experiencing this transition together. So I'm just so happy to bring you two thought leaders in the areas of trauma, recovery, joy, with a relational perspective and a collective perspective. We will, uh, as so I would like to introduce to you Esther Perel, who is a systems-oriented psychotherapist, New York Times bestselling author. She's one of today's most insightful and original voices on modern relationships. She's an internationally renowned cross-cultural therapist, fluent in nine languages. She trained with Salvador Mnuchin. Her TED Talks have been viewed by over 30 million viewers. And her best-selling books, Mating in Captivity and State of Affairs, have been translated into 30 languages. And she is the host of popular podcasts, Where Should We Begin and How Is Work? And you can learn more on her website, estereperel.com. And these links and her website are listed on our website for the webinar. Secondly, I am honored to introduce Jack Saul, who is a trauma therapist focusing on social advocacy and human rights. He's the founder of the International Trauma Studies Program. He's a pioneer in shifting the paradigm around trauma and mental health to one that includes the entire ecology of both the individual and their collective. He wrote Collective Trauma, Collective Healing, Promoting Community Resilience in the Aftermath of Disaster. He uses forms of creative expression such as art to help communities heal. He has the Moral Injury Public Listening Project, an art installation for veterans, journalists, witnesses of war so that they, regardless of how morally challenging their experiences are, they can express it and the public can witness and acknowledge it. So uh, first welcome Jack to our virtual webinar. Welcome Jack. Hi Alyssa. 
really we're nice. We're also to be using Jack's art for our, our webinar series. So you'll get to see uh, one of his paintings each month. So I'm gonna uh, start with a quote from one of Jack's book. Well, I'll, I'll tell you that during the pandemic, Jack started a group um, called the Resilience Collective. And we met each week to talk about how we were coping with the pandemic. It was a group of trauma therapists and, and um, an interdisciplinary group. And so when the papers started pouring out in JAMA and other journals on resilience, you know, finally the, we're, we're measuring the mental distress, the trauma, the impact on our essential workers and our healthcare workers. And then the question of how are we, how are we repairing? How are we building resilience? So I'd send Jack these papers and his response was always disappointment because all of these papers take an individual perspective. And you would say, there's nothing here on the collective. And so a quote from Jack's book is collective trauma can unravel our social foundation and communities are the antidote for trauma. So collective approaches require a different approach. Uh, collective, appro collective suffering requires a collective response. So that's my, what I'd first really like us to think about and dive into, Jack. So can you describe uh, how, you know, this difference between the individual and the collective perspective and how you talking about the communal perspective can, can help us heal? First of all, I think it, it wasn't so difficult to explain to people during the pandemic why uh, social support and social connection were so important for dealing with this crisis. It was just obvious to us because we were having to be socially distant and finding ways of being connected. So it just was a natural thing for us to have to uh, make these connections in order to be able to cope with and you know do conduct our lives, um, so I think uh, it's it's never been easier to kind of get people to to shift the, their thinking now and to see that when we're looking at a crisis like this, whether you call it a collective trauma or not, um, we have to be engaged in collective responses. And some of the most important things we do in, a, in this context are coming together as peers, uh, as parents discussing, you know, how we can best help our children, our families, um, coming together um, with other community, in community in some way, whether that community is um, one that we just formed on Zoom or, um, is a community that existed before that had to move to, to Zoom. Um, but, uh, you know, there have been so many innovations that took place during this pandemic where people had to be able to access not only, the, not only their individual resilience, but their collective, the collective resilience. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, uh, we tend to focus on individual resilience as if um, it just comes from our our grit and our perseverance and our internal strengths, but our, that resilience is always uh, needs to be. It always needs to be seen in the context of our our collective. Mm -hmm. We're only as resilient as the groups that we can connect with and derive resilience from those from those groups uh, and the and the and what we can access from family and community. And though families are resilient in themselves and communities are resilient in themselves. And our well-being is very much connected to the collective well-being of the communities that we belong to. It was very helpful to talk with you as we built our program at UCSF, our mental health response. And one thing you advised us is that we should try to build on what's there and not start anew. And, you know, in pre-existing meetings, we should be adding check-ins and adding providing resources and, and training managers how to hold space and support 
their, uh, their staff. And, and that was incredibly helpful. Another thing was this idea of trust and a communal narrative from leadership. And that, you know, I've seen that in our institution that how much it matters to be getting messages, you know, from the, from the chancellor of all UCs all the way down to our own chair, our own supervisors. And that type of, you know, creating meaning and, and acknowledging impact, I think has been an important part of being an institution at this time for me, feeling part of it. So let's get down to details. What, do, you know, you've worked with torture victims and uh, refugees and, not, you know, after disasters, you've been the one people have consulted. So after 9-11, you came in and you implemented, for example, a neighbor to neighbor guide. Can you give us a little bit of a picture of what that communal resilience group looks like and how you created it? Let me just give you some context. I had been working in Kosovo after the war the previous year, and uh, we were working to um, build a, a community mental health system there. Um, they had decided in Kosovo that they wanted to take a family and community resilience approach to their mental health system to take advantage of the large extended families in their society that were really the most valuable resource they had for promoting well-being after the war. And they had a, a lot to deal with, with 20 mental health professionals for 2 million people. So out of necessity, they needed to bring families together um, to support each other in taking care of the severely mentally ill. So three weeks after returning from Kosovo, 9-11 took place in my neighborhood. I live within a mile away and my children were going to school two blocks north of the World Trade Center. So we were faced with, how are we gonna address this as a school community and a number of school communities? And so um, I thought I'm, I'm gonna use what I just learned in Kosovo uh, that we shouldn't be relying on individual counseling screening kids or people and sending them just for individual counseling, but how do we mobilize the resources in the community to look at how we can address this as a collective? And so we had community forums and we were able to kind of look at what were the emerging needs were for children, for families, and then um, within those forums decide on a direction that we would take. What were the priority needs that we were going to address? And what were the resources we had as a community? And one of the main resources that we had was, is that we had a tremendous diversity of occupations in the school, school community, not just mental health professionals and health professionals, but artists and um, people from business, the business world, uh, organization, um, yeah, organizational consultants, uh, community activists, and th they were so important in coming together and and finding solutions from these different perspectives. And that's one of the most important principles of resilience: this kind of diversity of approaches that you can bring together. There's a synergy that's created, and that synergy also includes different age groups because in a collective resilience approach, children are extremely important in um, bringing kind of the playfulness and spontaneity and energy to a community that's going to a, through a crisis. And older people are really important in bringing the knowledge of how, we, how they've coped with previous crises during their lives. They, they, have a, they often have a tremendous amount of wisdom that's important in a, in a context like this. So we ended up generating, we, we um, as a community went to FEMA and said, don't just give the funding to the clinics outside to come in and help us, give us funding to support what we can do as a community. And we were able to get that funding and create kind of community foundation to support the work people were doing already in the community that was helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and well, that part is of that, 
I was going to say part of it was doing a, some of these narrative projects, uh, engaging people to tell the story about, you know, how they were dealing with the events of 9-11 as a family, as a community, and developing this kind of collective narrative, which, as you say, gives meaning and purpose to what we're going through, but it also is a community building activity in itself. It creates your identity as a community. And, um, and I think it gives you a sense of hope, ultimately. Mm, that is just that kind of narration. an important message right now. I wish Congress would hear you because they have been given, you know, billions to spend and distribute in part for the mental health impact of COVID. And so directing it to these, to, to the community, to small community organizations, so people can organize. And it also strikes me what, you know, your, your point about youth having a different voice and how that's part of their healing. We have, you know, a session on youth in the fall as they return to school. And we know that mm -hmm. they've been, you know, they've been victims. They've had um, a lot of mental health problems and to actually involve them in the narrative of how can you, if this happens again, what would you wish for other kids? How can you, um, what are your hopes for how we would deal with this differently? And so maybe art is part of that. You know, it's not going to be community. Well, listen, you're raising a really good point. If, when you're designing a response, you need to design it with the people that you, that are being, we're focusing on helping. Mm. They need to have a voice in the design process because they're the ones who best know, you know, what the issues are and, and how you can reach them and what's, what's going to be meaningful for them and what is going to be ultimately helpful. Mm -hmm. And how many times a week can they come and where can they come? You know, they can give you this kind of information that is crucial for creating a successful mental health mm -hmm. um, intervention. So another um, way that your ideas have influenced us here at UCSF is, so your point about really listening and hearing from people on the ground at all levels, what their needs are is, you know, as a researcher, that's an overwhelming idea. Focus groups and transcription and, you know, but, but the bottom line is in the real world, we're bringing people together in small groups and having them both support each other with creative solutions, but also talk about the structural things that could be improved. Cause that's where the, you know, the community or the institution can step in and hear what people are saying. So these, we're starting with small groups. We are, we're starting with pods for women who are, uh, have children, so caregivers, and they've been hard hit with the pandemic and been um, at, threat of you know not being able to continue their careers really and so so that's where we're starting but we hope that these pods will uh the idea will permeate all levels of our institution so that everyone has a small affinity group and can have a voice so that was you know part of the <laughs> no to collaborate with the pods to figure out how best to address what their needs are mm -hmm. uh, i think is a really important approach so now i would like to bring on Esther Perel, welcome Esther, and really um, think about this. Ah, it's so good to see you, thank Hello. you. Uh, one, one question for you, Esther, is, you know, I've really, um, your relational approach within couples, within family, with an extended family, has been such an important voice for millions of people during this pandemic, and, and people have, uh, you know, come to you, you hear the common questions, and in the moment you have created a lot of bodies of knowledge that have helped people with grief, loss, and, you know, view, making meaning of this. And of course, you know, as you've said, the, the relation, relationships, the quality of our relationships determine the quality of our lives. And that has been, that starts with ourselves and at home. So I would just like to uh, to welcome you to respond to what you've heard from Jack's perspective about communal responses and, and hear more about what you have um, learned from advising people about relationships. 
I think that there is a direct connection between the collective approach, between reaching out, between understanding that when you have this kind of disaster, it demands mass mutual reliance. Anyone who thinks that self-reliance and autonomy is going to get them somewhere at this moment um, is, is not really able to tap into what is actually helpful. So for families and couples, this has been uh, an extraordinary year and a half, uh, 15 months at this point, right? Um, that has included, uh, of course, f a confinement and lockdown, but also the complete collapse of boundaries between home and work, between the couple, the parents, the school teachers, the Zoom meetings, the fact that they are both working um, and all the roles are collapsed in one place. So that really dissolution of the boundaries has been very, very challenging. Typically, we are contextual beings, we get dressed, we change, we have rituals to go from one activity to another. When we go to work, we take a certain bag, we take certain clothes, we take a certain mindset. When we go to see friends, it's a different one. All these delineations and demarcations that define roles and define expectations and define meanings, gone. Then we um, um, also um, lost our routines and then we lost our rituals so the, the these three boundaries routines and rituals are such fun foundations for structure and organization and stability and predictability for us so on the other end what we have lived with is prolonged uncertainty and this prolonged uncertainty is still going on it's uh, we don't know when the uncertainty will end and you combine prolonged uncertainty with collective grief and with loss, and you begin to get a picture of mental health. And when I talk about loss, I'm not just talking about the actual loss to death. It's the sense that we have lost many intangible elements of our normal life. Sometimes we can't even identify what it is we're missing. And I borrowed the, the term from uh, Pauline Boss, who coined um, ambiguous loss. Ambiguous loss originally was the notion that you know, somebody can be still physically present, but emotionally and psychologically gone, like in a Alzheimer's situation, but they can also be emotionally very present and physically gone, inaccessible, like in confinement or buildings that are standing. The, the physical architecture stands, but the interpersonal architecture that usually lives in those offices, gone. And so we have a loss of spontaneity. We have a loss of, uh, of what I call eros, the serendipity, the, the unexpected, the surprise, that dimension of our life that is so tied into how we feel alive when we encounter discovery, novelty, etc. We have a loss of normalcy, we have a loss of plans, and we have a loss of safety and trust for many of us. So this is then what becomes part of when people say there is a lot of depression, and there is a lot of anxiety. And now put that in the context of a couple and a family, and maybe a few other people who live in the house that needed to be protected. And you get a picture of what happened recently. Well, maybe that's partly why I feel so disoriented. You know, I don't have many words for just feeling different and disoriented. <laughs> that's a... The word people have used is exhausted. And then more recently, you know, they began to talk about the term that Adam Grant wrote about in the Times about languishing. You know, we're not necessarily completely depressed, but we feel flat. It's like to flatten the curve, we've had to flatten ourselves. So we're languishing. You know, we're not flourishing, many of us. Some do, some did use this time for new creative projects, for reorienting their priorities, for uh, recommitting to their relationships. Basically, you, you have the whole range of how you know, what is the effect of a disaster on relationships and how do relationships affect the way that we will experience the disaster or the pandemic? Mm -hmm. It's the two way. Mm -hmm. Some of the questions that have come in are about how do we repair damage to relationships now that there's a little, you know, space. There's a question of how do we move on now with, having loss, loss of many things, as you've said, but also feeling that relationships have been battered. You know, there's been, there's been isolation. There's also probably been too much togetherness if there is such a 
I think. Absolutely. Yeah. It's called and domestic gravity. <laughs> it's a term from Lynn Berger. I mean, there are two terms that have been really very much a part of relational life. When is this domestic gravity? You know, we used to be homesick, now we're homestuck. And then the second one is enforced presentism. You can't make plans. You just think about today, you know, and it changed over the months. But basically, no one knows the summer. You know, you want to say, I'm going to do this something this summer. Who knows? You know, you think you can make plans. But then the prolonged uncertainty comes in and says, let's see where things are at at okay. that moment. So you are constantly straddling risk management and risk assessment. I think the most important thing for, for, for relationships couples that were 24 seven together, couples that were too far apart, families that suddenly were reunited when you know, people had ran away from them for, for years on end, is, is the acknowledgement of the normalcy of all of this. This is the nature of the beast. You know? And to blame the relationship is not necessarily the most accurate thing for that matter. It, but it is also so that often when people feel anxious, when people's coping styles become exacerbated and their differences are so highly manifest people take it out on each other when when there is uncertainty people pause it as if they're sure about something we should go back to work we shouldn't go back to work remote not remote it used to be we should leave the house not the, you know the fundamental thing is no one knows but people present it like you know that certainty is what helps you defeat fear a little bit and then you polarize against the person that is next to you. So the first thing is the recognition of, this was really hard on us. This was something that I never thought I was gonna have to go through. And this sucked whatever good juices existed between us. And um, I had nobody else to be angry at. <laughs> you know, you were one per you know, I often talk about how the couple has become one person for everything. One person is meant to fulfill an, the needs of an entire village, here we go. You are more my entire village. That really depleted us. That mm -hmm. is not unexpected. Mm -hmm. I think we probably need some time, you know, apart. We need to replenish from somewhere else. We need to see other people, have other conversations, get seen by others who validate us differently, who say something that you haven't said in 20 years or things like that. And then you come back to think. I think that in some way, the decisions made on the heels of a situation like that are sometimes truncated. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you. One of the questions that many of us have is how do we actively and kind of consciously make, make meaning of these experiences so that we can move ahead? So we have, you know, kind of a heavy blanket or shadow of loss and grief, and we want to feel as you said, Esther, on the edge of our seat, ready to engage in life and feel joy and feel vibrant. But there's uh, maybe that dullness and languishing. And you know, when you're at home, you're not on the edge of your seat, you're in the back of your seat. <laughs> um, so I would love to hear from both of you just any ideas about rituals. It could be family rituals, could be couple rituals, something that helps us start to have some structure, routine, dialogue, but acknowledgement of what we're going through. You know, we're in transition. We live with this chronic uncertainty, which you know that I'm a little bit obsessed with that idea. And we have scales for measuring. How are you tolerating uncertainty? Is this, a, is this really creating a lot of distress or are you able to live freely not knowing what's gonna happen tomorrow? You can't make plans next month. And we're even using that as a predictor in our, uh, our studies to look at how is your immune system responding to the, the COVID vaccination? We think that how well we can sit and be with uncertainty is so biologically important as well right now. So Jack, you were gonna say something about ritual? Yeah, I, I, well, first of all, we, it's really important that we keep the rituals that have been in our lives and not just throw them out. like holiday rituals, the birthdays, but even the um, daily rituals have become extremely important. As Esther said, we're, 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 we're conducting our, all of our lives in one place and we need to be able to differentiate uh, through having dinner, dinner time where you move, you know, you move your, the computer off the dinner table and put the plates on the table so that you demarcate 
changes, uh, you know, in your daily life. But I think one of the things that's really important um, as we're dealing with the year and going through this transition now, which I want to first say is we're not all we're not all going through it at the same pace. It's not the same transition for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's different in different parts of the country. It's different whether you've um, been had been vaccinated or not. Um, so we're at different stages and. Um, but as we're moving through this year and we're meeting these kind of anniversary points where we remember last year where we were at, I think it's important that we, um, we mark those uh, anniversary reactions like the beginning of summer or going back to school next year in the fall, whether it's going back in person or not but they need to be both celebrations, but allowing for the space for people to deal with the grief and kind of um, more painful feelings that they've had over the past year, the feelings of loss, um, <clears throat> the regrets about the changes that have taken place in their life. So my, just a my... word of, about resilience. Um, resilience is not about just bouncing back. It's, bounce, it's about bouncing forward. Uh, usually when we're dealing with a crisis like this, we're not wanting to go back to the way things were before. We're going to a new normal. And hopefully um, we're moving toward something that addresses some of the structural factors in our society that have actually led to a lot of the vulnerabilities. A lot of the things that made some parts of our population more vulnerable than others, but we have a health system and a public health system that re we really need to upgrade to deal with the, with pandemics like this. Because there, this is just one. We're going to be seeing this again probably, as well as other kinds of uh, kind of environmental crises. So this new normal, we better be taking what we've learned about dealing with this a crisis in the past year and be able to apply it to some of the upcoming challenges that we're going to be faced with. So I would uh, like to point out that, you know, the, you know, we've talked about the answers in, our, in psychotherapy, but in between us and creating um, repair knowledge, meaning together, as well as through creative expression. So my tendency as we were planning this, as you know, was as a, you know, kind of left brain dominant person, I fight that, but list and quantify all the losses. I mean, as Esther has such a, a granular language for our experiences of, of ambiguous loss. And, uh, and I know that you two have different ways of working through trauma, grief, self-awareness, and, and growth. And that is much more through movement, through dance, through art, through expression, through language, but not making a list, but rather ex exploration. So I, I'm wondering if you can each lead us through um, an exercise now to help each person listening just get in touch with integrating their experience right now, both of grief, loss, joy, hope. Just, so, you know, yeah. Do you so, want to start, Esther? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, one thing that we could do is just, first of all, let's have a moment of silence just to reflect on the past year or past 15 months. Thank you, Jack. I'm gonna close my eyes. You can close your eyes and just think about some of the things that had changed for you in your life, some of the things you lost, some of the challenges that you have had to meet during the past year. 
And also think about some of the things you learn about yourself, some of the blessings that you experienced during the past year. If you have a piece of paper in front of you, rather than making a list, I was going to suggest that you make kind of a mind map where you, on this piece of paper, write down a word or phrase about a challenge or loss or a blessing that happened during the past year for you. Anywhere on the piece of paper, just randomly. And if you can just come up with the first thing that comes to your mind, that's even better. And you can make a little drawing of that thing, or you can uh, represent it with the title of a song or a poem. Just, just, write, just fill the paper up as much as possible with these little phrases or, or words or little doodles to activate your, the right side of your brain. Now take a look at that piece of paper. And what does it tell you about your past year? When you look at all the things you've written on this piece of paper. So, so I think it's important to acknowledge not only the loss and difficulties, but I think for many of us, we experienced some blessings, some connections with people that were very special. Uh, we had experiences also in the midst of this that were really positive experiences. And those, were, those are very important to acknowledge you know, during a crisis like this as well. Okay. So if I was to do this in a relational context, couple, family, group of friends, Zoom or wherever, I would have everybody draw it. And then I would say, now change paper, give yours to somebody else. And then people would start to read other people's lists. And then it wouldn't just be, what have you learned about yourself and your own year, but what have you learned about the other people's year? And did you even know that even though you were living right next to them? And what can they tell you about yours and what can you tell them about theirs? And then you introduce the relational component to, um, to this kind of awareness. I, I, you asked about rituals and, um, you know, I think Jack's idea is exactly, you know, when you cook a meal every night, it's a dinner. When you make the nice table, you turn a routine into a, into a ritual. It, a ritual is basically a routine invested with creativity and intention that gives it meaning and importance. It's not, it's not a big, big, big thing. But I think that um, on the ritual level and on the meaning-making level, for me, it went into 
two directions. One was this very important concept that I kept referring back to from the Austrian psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, tragic optimism. This ability that we have to find hope and meaning in the midst of negative or painful experiences. Um, but then I thought, you know, um, there's a there's a thing I've done with a lot a lot of patients and 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 during talks and groups that I've worked with. In one instance, I would ask people to just get up right now as we are talking and to find one object around you that represents um, an aspect um, that that you can choose. You can either say something that you learned about yourself during this pandemic, something that you would like to hold on to from what you have learned to pick up on Jack's thing during. The, this past year. And then you pick up another object of something that you actually want to let go of. And then you do this basically with the people in the house. Why? Because sometimes you need a transitional object through which to tell a story. People need to be able to tell the story of their past year to each other, not just a feeling, but there is a story around these feelings. And that's when I thought about creating a game. So I spent much of my pandemic thinking about how do I bring back intimacy and playfulness by creating an actual game of storytelling um, so that people would have a tool that during the lockdown, but also when they come out to deal with the awkwardness, to deal with how do you ask these difficult questions? Um, you know, you want to know, but you're afraid to ask because you don't want to intrude on people. You don't want to make them uncomfortable. And yet people are really eager to share with each other pieces like that. And so I think that the structure of, of playing and of a game is intensely important. It's called Where Should We Begin? Like the podcast. But the notion was it's a ritual. When you play, there's a ritual. There are rules that you have to follow. People to follow a certain sequence. It is in de facto playing is a ritualized activity. And ritual has carried us, be it religious rituals or, 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 or communal rituals, have carried us through the difficult times forever and ever. Many people already know this, but um, you two are married. <laughs> Sarah and Jack um, are have their own rituals. And I was just wondering if there's anyone that you guys might want to share with us of how you, maybe something new from the pandemic or something that's been a go-to. I think one of the first ones for us um, mainly because we had no evening activities and because we were completely just us too, was that we began to take walks. You know, I had always traveled to parts of the world where at five o'clock the sun goes down, it's less hot and people come out and they walk, they walk on the promenade, on the riverfront, on the ocean front. And I just thought, this is very similar. We're doing the same thing. We're just walking and talking and, and basically checking in with each other about not just about the day, but about how you're doing, about, about our coping styles, about how, you know, um, about the things I worried about and the things he made me laugh about. I think one of the big rituals was um, him finding a good amount of black humor to kind of, you know, make me laugh when normally I would be shaking. And that also was a ritual. It's like you turn to someone and you know that you're going to get something that's going just to help you to have your next breath be deeper and more, you know, more grounded. So that's the, I think, when in the beginning, I think that's the one that stands out for me. What about you, Jack? Well, I think that what happened like, for us was that um, we had, we formed a number of like film clubs and book club meetings. I mean, it was like every two weeks, there was another one of these um, meetings where people could get together talk about a film or book. Um, so that we wouldn't have to talk about it. the pandemic. <laughs> what? What's that? So that we could talk about something else. Yes. But it became a regular kind of meeting and, um, and kind of fun thing to do when you couldn't meet the people in person. So this was all Zoom based. And three continents. And so and um, I also saw very you. Important. You were surrounded by uh, phenomenal nature, lakes, 
uh, sunsets, forest up in Woodstock. So um, did, you know, did you, do you think of that as a coping mechanism or how, what? Yeah, definitely. I think my, one of the greatest gifts that I had from this year was being in nature in a way that I had not been in in decades. I had, I don't even remember when I have seen the seasons go change in a more nuanced way from to spring to summer to fall. And I got to see it up close. And, um, and I think that that connection to nature was extremely important for me. Um, reminded me of uh, uh, the, um, one of my teachers, Robert J. Lifton, in his book on the broken connection, talks about how we need to connect with some, something that symbolizes immortality. And for many of us, nature uh, provides that, that symbolism. For others, it may be God or transcendent, some kind of spiritual uh, connection or a creative activity or through our children, you know, there's just something that connects us with, with uh, um, life beyond the moment, beyond the experience of death um, and our mortality. Beautiful. So this is in one of the major antidotes mm -hmm. for being in the face of uh, the potential for death and the enormity of loss is to connect with something, this kind of symbolic sense of immortality. It's been my experience that nature has been, you know, my, one of my number one go-tos, <clears throat> multi-sensory nature, the non-cognitive way that it, the effect it has on our mind and our body. And the, the research on nature is, is actually phenomenal. It's mostly from Korea and Asian countries, but it is, um, it is having an experience in nature and forest bathing, having a regular experience is actually reversing uh, stress pathways, cortisol, inflammation, reduces blood pressure. And for me, just the non-cognitive of words for it, but just the way that it can reduce rumination because as you said, it is this larger context. And so all of a sudden our problems, it, you know, become in perspective. But I do want to add that part of the existential threats that we live in now taint the nature experience for me. I cannot not feel some of the sadness of seeing the beauty and wondering, is it forever, Jack? Is mm. it, you know, it, how much of this is our, our um, you know, future generations going to get to experience? Mm. You know, we'll, I mean, I, I, yeah. We'll have smoke soon here. You know, we're, and, and you will feel, you will see it and feel it eventually. It's just uh, our new, you know, part of our new context. But this, you know, this adversity, it does bring us to the topic of joy. And I know, Esther, I've, you know, I've read about the, the joy that you felt living among Holocaust survivors and Jack working with torture survivors and the, you, you know, the, the kind of, Joy is an act of resistance and the contrast between having to live with existential threats or such, such grief and how the bounce back of the human spirit is at being able to also experience joy at the same time. And it, re it reminds me, I, I, uh, you've probably seen the Book of Joy by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And the, the story of that book is really about adversity, living with adversity, and how that kind of working for feeling purpose and meaning and working for the greater good became such big sources of joy. And so I'm wondering, I would love to talk about really getting in touch with, you know, the full experience of joy, acknowledging the, the blanket of grief, the, the, the types of grief that we've listed and the ones I think one of the most important moments at this time uh, that I see joy and that joy that sits completely on grief is when I look every day every day I see people who are meeting who haven't seen each other in so long and who are 
saying, are you huggable? And then they hug and their entire touch hunger of 15 months is just completely melting in that embrace. I mean, that is the probably the most prevalent one um, where the contact itself sits on the loss and the lack of contact that so many people have had, a disembodied kind of a life, you know, the screen life we're having right now as we speak, uh, which is the opposite of when you're in nature as well. You know, you don't feel anything when you, there's no breeze, there's no sun, there's no wind, there's no light, there, nothing touches your skin, you know. So that's one that I think in the moment you see pure joy, elation, people who are just like, ah, and they they take you in and they hold. Um, so that's the, the, the first one that comes to mind. And I, something similar came to mind for me. <clears throat> and it's um, this, the, when I've seen people who have been pretty severely traumatized, they get constricted in their bodies and they're like holding themselves like this. And we have this wonderful uh, friend who's an expressive arts therapist in Norway working with refugees and she would take have the Melinda Meyer and she would invite these um, Bosnian refugees to her physical training class and have them engage in the uh, movements that they were no longer engaged in like picking apples from the trees and cutting the grass. And you could see when they started to resume these movements that they had not you know, engaged in uh, for months, this energy was coming into their bodies. And that energy was so important in Life helping force. them heal from what they had been through. And you, you saw them like two weeks later and they were all laughing and moving around. And uh, it was, they, they just gotten reconnected with that energy, which is so important for healing from being through difficult times. It's interesting that the hugging is, is the symbol of this kind of renewed movement. I think that's so important for us in this transition. We want right. to take some questions actually, just uh, curious. Yes, I, I will give you a question. We have about um, seven minutes. Just one thing that strikes me about Joy is just that uh, that everything you've mentioned, and Esther, we've posted a lot of your re um, readings on uh, erotic sensuality, that they are all things that that are within and between us. And we don't need to get back on planes and fly around and have, you know, have these kind of high cost experiences because it really is at our, it's in the, uh, you know, attentional awareness of the changes of the seasons and the gratitude in that you know being able to embodied and being able to hug someone mm -hmm. well perfect. said so let me give you a question that i think sums up a lot of what we've talked about uh this uh is from a professor i work at an urban public university we've been remote for 14 months in september all of our campus community students faculty staff will be back in person but I'm not hearing joy. I'm hearing fear, apprehension, frustration about managing this another transition with its unknowns. And I'm wondering what rituals you might recommend that we create in returning to campus that acknowledge our griefs, traumas from the past year, but also uplifts us with connection, shared humanity, um, being in the same physical space. I think immediately about the school of our children after 9-11, where an entire wall was turned into an art project where everybody, every child, every teacher, everyone who walked into that building could express something having to do with what had happened to their neighborhood um, of, in all sorts. I think that the notion of an art project, of a public expression, of a mural, where people now it can be, the, the, we can decide, it can be, you know, um, apprehension, it can be anticipation, positive anticipation, the welcoming of the unknown. When the unknown is exciting, what does it look like? When we come with curiosity rather than anxiety, what does it look like? When we come with our imagination as the gate to freedom when we are confined, 
What does it look like? But not in talking, but literally in an art piece with a sound installation, with somebody who does the music for it. And, some, and I think that everyone who has something to say gets to put it up and it becomes the mural that expresses a moment in time for our community. It's an incredible idea. And before I ask Jack, I will say, this is a crowdsourcing exercise. We are all returning from something to something. And the idea of having marking this time and having this communal experience and rituals is something we can all think about and apply. So I would love to hear everyone's ideas who hears this and we can share them in our, in our next, next month in our next episode. Cause this is a, uh, we need all of that curiosity and creativity and ideas. And I, I love your idea, Esther. I have another idea that also I thought of when I, I saw this question. We went to a conference in Cuba, Jack and I, uh, mm. an international psychiatric conference. Now, typically in America, North America, conferences, um, you know, have all the material, the content, the series, the presentation, day, the one day, two, three, four. And then at the last evening, there is the bala, the, the ball, the whatever, the, you know, the party. And, uh, and people may or may not come by then because, you know, to do a little bit of dancing at the end of the event. We, in Cuba, they did it the other way around. Before the opening speech, they had a whole group of children that began to come into the audience in huge amphitheater and began to teach us all salsa. Then came the keynote, the opening address, then came the workshops, and the first evening was the dance party. So that by the end of the evening, you had danced for two, three hours with just all kinds of people that you've never met. And then you went and you started to do your serious conversations. I, love I it. never forgot that. Yeah, so it's this joy. <laughs> Celebrating life and being together first, not last, and not optional. <laughs> the being first I had the, and doing later. I had the same, my, my mind went also to dance. It's one of the things that we did after yeah, 9 /11 We was, are living together, don't we? <laughs> after 9-11, one of the things that was really important was that the, this, the community created a samba school for That's kids. Right with drumming and dancing. And that was one of the most effective ways of helping kids deal with the stress of what they had been through. And it was just a beautiful um, uh, program that was created. So and, I would say, the kids. I would say have a dance, you know, in returning to school, I would organize it around the big dance, dance party, mm. um, from for one thing permission to celebrate have to move. Yeah. it's they permission to celebrate it's movement it's an embodied experience you know the, in, the the very important thing about dance is that you can write and compose and paint and do all the other art modalities while you are upset sad hurt despairing you cannot dance in the midst of despair the body won't let it because the body in despair is a, is a different position. When you dance, your shoulders lift, your head goes up. And so by definition, it puts you in a good mood. It, 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 it demands joy. It yes. commands joy and it brings you to joy. Absolutely. The, the you know, mind changes the body, the body can change the mind and shape our emotions. And so that's a wonderful um, way of creating joy that we, we need to- Say do. that again. You said the, that very fast. The body, well, we always think about our thoughts as the dominant king and they're changing our body and stress is, you know, maybe going to hurt our body. But the opposite is true too, which is that when we change our body position, we're changing our emotions. When we lie down, we cannot experience intense anger in the same way that when we're standing up. And so have an argument with your partner lying down. <laughs> it's a... Uh, you know, it, these ways that we embody motion, as you talked about, if we're on the edge of our seat, we're in, we're changing our attention, we're engaged, we're receptive. And so all of this integrating, you know, being coming more sensory aware of our body as we're re-engaging in, in life is, is so beautiful. Last year, Esther, we talked about uh, the barrier of loneliness and the stigma of reaching out and needing other people. 
and you were fighting that. And, you know, I think you said four times in a row, group, 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 groups, join groups, this type of group, that type of group. You guys had your movie group. And, you know, that's, that is more important now as ever that we reach out and we need each other. We especially need each other in this next chapter. And when you reach out, sometimes you're the helpful one too. And that will give you purpose and meaning too. The fact that you can do something for others. It's not just going to ask them to do for you or with you. It's your presence that brings something too. That's absolutely right. We each have a role. So this idea of mass mutual reliance and communal healing are, are words we should be talking about. My, my last point is on our website. We, uh, we talk about also, if you have experienced loss, there are a few readings uh, from Esther and also from our mutual friend, Michael Hebb, about talking about death at dinner. You know, Esther, you've taken away stigma from talking about sex, and now you're helping us talk about grief and death. And it's these conversations that we need. And so I'm going to, we're going to end showing the slide for Esther's resources. And if you just join her Instagram, you will have such, you know, such rich conversations at your fingertips. So please take a picture of that and also look at our website. And I just am so grateful to both of you for your time. You're both very busy for joining me, for doing it together. It was incredibly special to have both of your inputs in this dialogue, such different but complementary um, and wedded perspectives. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a great uh, month, everyone. We will see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.